And finally, we worked out a per share value today. Hi everyone, Andrew here. So we are going to go through exactly how to find the intrinsic value of a stock. It is a simple method to work out what a business is worth. Now, just don't be intimidated with all the numbers. It's only a ballpark figure anyway. I'll explain why it isn't, a, it isn't perfect many times throughout this example, but it is a great way to get a starting point. The cool thing is that it really isn't too hard and something that after maybe like five minutes, you should be pretty comfortable with. All right, so before I jump in, you might want to follow along with the same calculator that I'm using. It's in the description. Also in the description, there's a link to my broker of choice, Interactive Brokers, which is by far the best broker in the world. And below that is another link to my monthly e-magazine, which includes all the calculations for a range of companies that I follow. So you don't have to do that yourself every month. All right, so let's go through this as clearly as I can. All right, so I'm gonna paraphrase Nick Sleep and Warren Buffett here because I think they say it better than I could. This is really important before we jump into the numbers. So the debate over growth and value is quite unnecessary. Warren Buffett got it right years ago. He said something like this, value investing is a widely used term. People think it is this old school net net stocks where the cash in the bank is far more valuable than the share price. The cigar butt idea, but that is just one idea in value investing. See, all investing is value investing. Things like low price to book ratios or low PE ratios or high dividend yields. Unfortunately, such characteristics, even if they appear in some sort of combination, these are far from determining factors as to whether an investor is indeed buying something for what it is worth and is therefore truly operating on the principle of obtaining value in the investment. Correspondingly, Opposite characteristics like the high price to book ratio or a high PE ratio and a low dividend yield, that's no way inconsistent with a value purchase. So Nick Sleep comments on top of this by saying, we won't end the debate here, but so that we all understand, our definition is that a business is worth the free cash flow that it can be expected to generate between now and judgment day, discounted back at a reasonable rate, period. Growth is therefore inherently part of the value judgment not a separate discipline. So this calculator includes growth. It is built in. Growth and value are not separate things. So before you think that I don't get it and tell me that Tesla is growing super fast, well, I can tell you now we can factor that in. All right, so growth rates from years one to five. Now this is from your analysis of understanding the company. If you want to not have an analytical edge, you can just use the growth rates that analysts think. But where you will find treasure is when you figure out the growth rates yourself based on your knowledge of the company. So to find what the analysts think, I'm over in Yahoo Finance and I've just gone to Microsoft and I've pressed on analysis and down the bottom, it tells me the growth estimates for Microsoft and it says that, well, the past five years is 18%. The next five years, about the same, 17, 17 and a half percent. And that's what the analysts think. But when I go and have a look at Microsoft's numbers myself, it does tell a little bit of a different story. And I'm going to disagree with the analysts. See, if I look at operating cash or book value per share or revenue growth over the past sort of 10 years, let's look at the actual numbers here. So operating cash flow was 30 billion, 30 billion, 30 billion, 30 billion, 30 billion. So there's five years of practically no growth of the operating cash flow. The revenue went from 73 to 85 over that period. So look, what's that about two, 3% growth per annum? Like that is, that is not anywhere near 17 what the analysts think. It's the last five years where it has taken off a little bit. So we've gone from well, 30 to 40 to 40 to 50 to 60 to, 75 to 80. So it's gone from, it's doubled over a five year period. So what's that about 15% per annum? So I, I understand like, well, that's that's that 18% for the analysts uh, from the from Yahoo Finance, they said 18%. So okay, I can see that's about 18%. Look, maybe the growth over those last couple of years uh, isn't that sustainable. In the previous five years before that, it was nearly zero growth. So. 18% seems actually a bit too optimistic in my eyes. I'm going to say 10% because 10% is somewhere between those lower growth rates and the more recent higher growth rates. Maybe it was pandemic related. Maybe it was good management decisions. Uh, I'm not really sure, but I'm gonna be a little bit more conservative here. And that's where I'm going to do my analysis. 
So I would go in and try to work this out, what I think the future holds, all that type of stuff. And you would have to do the same. So that's where we get the growth rate from. Now looking at the growth rate from year six to 10, and that's gonna be even harder to get right because it's further away. But I like to just slow things down just to be safe. You can essentially do whatever you like here. If you think the business is building out a solid foundation is going to reap the rewards later in the decade, well, by all means, put the growth rates higher for this period. But for me, 8%. Now I wanna be really clear here. This is why the calculator is far from perfect. These growth rates are hopefully close to correct, but you could also be wrong. It's more art and analysis than cold hard science and math. There is just a lot of speculation, experience and research to get a good feel for the future of the business. Then a war happens or a pandemic happens and throws everything off anyway. So don't get too lost in the numbers. Just try to land in the ballpark and be conservative just to be safe. Okay, next is the ROI goal. So this is where I get the most pushback. Now, I used to be happy with a 15, 20% as a discount rate, but that didn't have enough margin of safety in my opinion. So I now start at 22% as my discount rate and actually aim for 30%. And what this means is that all those cash flows over the next 10 years are added up and discounted back at 22% of today's value. And that is what this present value PV column is doing. And this is how we work out if the price is in the ballpark. We add up all the cash flows and discount them back to today's value. And I'm discounting this at 22%. Now let's just say you wanted to get 100% per annum returns. Well, in this example, well, you would need, I need to change this to 100%. And you would see that you need to buy this at $17 based on these growth rates. Now that would be pretty epic. And I can tell you now, if we see a $17 stock price without a stock split, well, it will be because of fraud and our numbers aren't right anyway. Now, if you wanna know the exact math, you can see the formulas I've used, or you can just Google a formula for working out discount rates. Now with the multiple, when we buy shares, at the moment we are calculating all the future cash flows and discounting them back to today. It would be great to do this into infinity, but my calculator assumes that we could actually sell the shares on the market after 10 years. So based on the growth rates and the quality of the company, we probably could sell the shares for about 10 or 20 times the cash flow. That's about right over the long term for most companies. And the best way to think of it is like an apartment. See, you collect rent for 10 years. Well, the apartment can still be sold after 10 years and you won't sell it for just one year's rent. You'll sell it for 10 or 20 times the yearly rent. And if rents have gone up over the 10 years, well, you won't sell it for today's rent you will sell it for a multiple of that future rent in 2032. So we add that onto the cash flows that the business returns to us because that is part of the value. And I use a multiple of 20 in this example as Microsoft is a high quality company and has proven itself to be a high quality company. Okay, operating cash flow minus maintenance capex. What we are trying to do here is figure out how much cash the business is making for the owners. Now operating cash flow is just the cash the business produced for the year. That's pretty simple. But with this money, the company will probably want to spend some of it into new growth initiatives. Plus, they will want to spend some to maintain the current factories and buildings and things like that. So the money used for maintenance, this is not negotiable. It has to be spent, otherwise the operations will go backwards. But growth initiatives are the business reinvesting into the future. And that is a management decision to use the money that could go to shareholders, but instead they try to grow the business further. So in an ideal world, in the financial statements, you could find exactly how much is spent on the growth initiatives and then the maintenance stuff. We want to find just this maintenance number because that definitely can't go to us as owners. The growth spending, well, that is actually our money getting reinvested to make more money. So whenever possible, we try to find the operating cash flow and subtract the maintenance capital expenses. But unfortunately, most of the time, this number isn't disclosed by the business. We are just left to guess. Now, in this case, the simplest way is to just get the operating cash flow number and subtract all of the capital expenditures. And this number is called free cash flow. This is conservative, so it won't hurt, but it isn't anywhere near as accurate as finding the maintenance capital expense number. So when I have a look at Microsoft's most recent investor report, it talks about all the growth things they are using their money for. But of course, some of it must be for that maintenance. They have data centers and buildings, but they actually don't break it down for us here. So a decent rule of thumb is a 50-50 split between growth and maintenance. Now that isn't very accurate, is it? 
See again how this isn't perfect? There's a lot of guesswork going on. So I'm in ticker terminal here and I'm looking at the last 12 months here from Microsoft and they have the operating cash flow is 83, call it 84 billion dollars and this capital expenditure line. So it's 23 billion. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna halve the 23 number. So half of, half of 23 is what, 11 and a half. So I'm gonna call 11 and a half maintenance and 11 and a half growth. So I take 11 and a half off the 84, that's about 72, that, that'll do. 72 billion is what I would use for the uh, uh, cash from operations minus the maintenance capex, I would use 72 billion. Okay, shares outstanding. Now I include this number so we can work out the price per share to pay for the investment. Something the calculator doesn't factor in is if the share numbers are getting larger or smaller. Companies issue shares to employees as bonuses and to raise money. And sometimes companies buy back shares. And if a company is buying back lots of shares, I might add a percent or two onto the growth rates or subtract a percent or two if dilution is happening. Now for Microsoft, well, they're buying back shares and doing it quite consistently, as you can see here with the shares outstanding number here in the financials. And it looks like about 1%. So I'm gonna go and add that percent to the growth rates to account for this continuing. And the last thing we need to do is look at the total cash and debt. And definitely need to include this because since we are buying a piece of the business, we buy their cash and the debt that they have. Some companies have actually huge piles of debt and that makes them far less valuable. Car companies are what comes to mind here. And to find this number, well, I'm in ticker terminal here. I go to the balance sheet and I scroll down all the way down to where it says net debt. Now this would be the total debt they have, but since it's in brackets and it's red, it means that it's a negative net debt number, which means that they've got, well, it's two negatives make a positive. So they've actually got $45 billion worth of cash um, more than their debt. So 45 billion would be the number. So back in my calculator, I put 45 billion and just call the debt zero. Now there's not they have, don't have zero debt, they have more than that, but they have 45 billion more cash than debt. So that's why I've got 45 billion here. So we have everything we need now and the calculator has added up all the cash flows, added the cash, taken away the debt, we have grown the cash flows at, our, at the rates we wanted. We've subtracted them back to the discount rate that we wanted. We've added a multiple we could sell the cash flow for in 10 years time. And finally, we've worked out a per share value today. So generally speaking, at 22%, I'm getting pretty interested. At 30%, I'm looking for cash to buy as much as I think I can handle. And for Microsoft in this example, well, $120 is getting interesting for me. And I haven't looked for hidden assets or hidden potential cash flow. So that is where you need an analytical edge over me. If you can find something hidden, maybe those growth rates need to be lifted. Now you also might be thinking that 30% discount rate is crazy. The market on average returns like seven to 10%. How could I possibly think I'll get 30%? I'll never buy anything, right? Well, go run the numbers for Alibaba right now. Tell me what you get and leave your findings in a comment. Now, a quick shout out here to Brian Scott. Thanks for the comments and all the support. You are a legend. Thanks for staying to the end of the video and I'll see you next time.